the northwest corner of the Oklahoma City metro area, just north of Overholzer Lake, is a small area known as Stinchcomb Wildlife Management Area. It's surrounded by suburbia, but it's known for one thing, Bigfoot. At first glance, you wouldn't think that there would be any kind of cryptid activity in an area that's completely surrounded by a major metropolitan area, but you would be wrong. This place has over 50 years of documented encounters to its reputation. And of all the places that you would think that the Finding Bigfoot crew would go to in Oklahoma, this is it, Stinchcomb. Join us as we do our own investigation into the Stinchcomb Enigma. We're also going to reach out to other investigators in the area and get their take on things. But first, let me give you an explanation on how I got introduced to this mysterious thousand acres of woods. In 1996, I was a refrigeration service tech in the Oklahoma City metro area. I was working at this grocery store whenever I accidentally stumbled into my very first Sasquatch investigation. It's tough to call what I did here an actual investigation. I was more of a curious bystander who just stumbled into an unusual situation and decided to take a look into it. I was trying to get my ticket signed off so that I could go ahead and move on to my next service call when somebody came up to the store manager that I was talking to and said, you're not going to believe this, but two ladies just saw a Bigfoot over here on Overholzer Drive. He mentioned that the cops were actually over there investigating the incident. My mind was blown. I was like, I got to drive over there and check this out. As soon as I got to Overholzer Road, I could see the lights from the police cruisers. I drove over and what I saw was two cops talking to what appeared to be the homeowners by a set of trash cans. As the story goes, there were two lady joggers who were jogging along over Holster Road and they saw this Sasquatch digging in the trash cans up around the house. I guess it figured out that it was busted and it took off running and ran north. Later that night, it was on the news that the creature had actually ran all the way to Highway 66 and had gone into Stinchcomb Wildlife Management Area. I had never even heard of Stinchcomb before, but I was determined to investigate, so I went out and walked around the area myself, alone, and I actually found what we know now as tree structures. We had no idea what tree structures were back in 1996, but there they were, and they were tough to explain, even back then. Mr. Bailey, I appreciate you taking time to meet me out here. Well, thank you for the invitation, Brian. This is one of my favorite places. Happy to do it. All right. Well, um, a few months ago, I believe, um, a lady reached out to you about an encounter. and It, it could be the oldest encounter that we've ever received from Stinchcomb. You wanna take a second and tell us about it? Yes, she contacted us. She had seen the No Bro website and uh, was looking for, she hadn't told anybody in a long time this story, but uh, she contacted me through the email address on, on the website since I was local and uh, said that when she was a teenager in the early 1970s, um, before Stinchcomb Refuge was here, this was just what they called the river road or out here, the river area, uh -huh. North Canadian River, and uh, northwest side of Oklahoma City. Um, and they kids would come out here, you know, just to party and, and have a good time, swim, things like that, fish. And uh, she got invited uh, with a group of her friends to, uh, they're gonna have a bonfire out here. Uh -huh. And uh, so it was uh, early autumn, it was very warm. Uh, she said it had been real dry, so the river was very low, and um, they got out here early evening and swam and things like that, and uh, as it got dark, then they decided that they were going to wade the river. Her and her friends were going to leave the bonfire where there were a lot of other kids, 
and just wade up river. Um, she said they had waded uh, quite a ways up river and uh, all of a sudden began to hear something large moving through the brush on the other side of the river. And then uh, as it got closer, it started screaming and uh, at them and it, it frightened them so bad they, they just uh, turned around and headed back you know, toward the safety of their group. Um, mm -hmm. And she said it followed them, uh, paralleled them, paced them along the river back in the woods. They never saw it, of course it was dark. Um, I think she said they had some tiny flashlights but they weren't working really well. Um, but she said it was a good moonlit night so they were just all, you know, trying to get back to the campfire as soon as they could. Um, <laughs> And she said it, it stopped just short of, of where the bonfire was and stopped following them, but they were very, very spooked. Um, she said it was very large, it was breaking branches, <coughs> uh, things like that. Uh, when they got back to the campfire, uh, you know, their friends could tell they were upset and they told them what happened, but everybody had a big laugh about it. But she said she never forgot that and, uh, and has, has thought about that for a long time. And then when she saw uh, some of our videos and other things about uh, the Stinchcombe Refuge and the North Canadian River that brought all that back and she just wanted to uh, to make her report just uh, to uh, record that encounter and, for, and document that. That's awesome. You know, people that are older than us, you know, there was a there was even less likely back in the day that they would talk openly about this kind of stuff. And it's really cool that she came forward and, and uh, you know, shared her story with us, you know. Um, if, that, if that happened in, you know, 1972, that was over 50 years ago. Yeah. So can you imagine what this place looked like back then? Right. I'm sure it was pretty wild. Yeah. Um, and, and it's amazing, though, that uh, stories, uh, encounters uh, come out of here. Up until the present times, uh, it's just just amazing the history. Right. Uh, even though uh, just you know less than a mile down the road here, you're in the middle of major metropolitan city, uh, but yet you get out here in this thousand acres along the river, and, and as you can see in the background, it's it's wild and woolly. Uh, but yet you can hear Highway 66 over here in the distance. Right. Yeah, you've got an airport just over here to the east. You've got uh, the Highway 66, a major travel route to the south. Yeah. This is suburbia. Right, right. Right. Mm. Yeah. So you've also done work with a group called the North Canadian River Project. And that work goes back several years. And it primarily focuses on this river, right? Right. And. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that group and what the kind of work that you guys, research work that you guys have done over the years with okay. them? Well, Kurt Stanley originally started that group um, uh, back around uh, 2010 or so. Um, and uh, I joined in with it in 2014 and then some other members uh, of came in and became active in the group um, mm -hmm. and we primarily uh, limited our research on the North Canadian River uh, from the El Reno, well Calumet El Reno area the uh, over near the, the casino area, the Cheyenne mm -hmm. Arapaho tribal area, Concho, the, the, famous, Concho area. the famous footage. Yeah. Right, right. Um, all the way down here, following the river down to uh, Stinchcombe Refuge, where it and where the river enters uh, Lake Overholster in Oklahoma City. Right. Um, and so, but we had some permission to research on some properties on the river, private properties right. uh, in the El Reno area. Uh, now we we couldn't research on Concho on tribal land because right. none of us were tribal members, but. Um, but on some land just south of there that uh, was private property that we did have permission. And we had uh, some, some uh, areas where we could camp along the river and hike. And uh, we did, we located, you know, several nice tracks, uh, footprints and documented those. We, we 
had FLIR footage. And, I remember uh, that. Right, we had yeah. two members that had come out to camp early and uh, the first night they had a lot of activity <coughs> and, and captured some excellent FLIR footage of uh, two uh, and possibly a juvenile, uh, two adults and possibly a juvenile uh, sneaking up a, uh, a, a creek bank. Um, what year do you think that was? That was probably 2017, I believe. Um, and so uh, we've had a lot of good finds there, uh, lots of activity. We found, uh, you know, we found we found some scat that was uh, nearly two feet long. I remember that. Uh, there on a, on a sandbar. Yeah. Um, uh, Great video, by right. the way. I, I, yep. I was mind blown by that. I probably watched that part like three or four times. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ryan White, who's one of our original members um, from Skytook, uh, he uh, is also known as the Squatch Ranger, and he yeah. uh, documents all of our field work uh, on video mm -hmm. and has produced several videos. And uh, so we've, uh, we've appreciated his work on that, right. documenting all of our finds. But we had good success in that area. <clears throat> and so we continue to, to research up and down the river um, and just from just from what we've the, the reports that we've heard and documented and the field work that we've done, uh, we really believe that there's probably, I would say, uh, some small clans and individual creatures right. that move up and down the river here seasonally. Right. I don't know if you'd call it an actual migration, but yeah. uh, they do maybe tend to use certain parts of the of the river at certain times of the year, right. whether that's because of food availability or cover or lack of human presence. Um, right. Kind of seems like to me that from what we've done, it, it, it seems like the Stinchcombe area is maybe more active in late winter, early spring. Um, like now. Right. Uh, because mm -hmm. there's a lack of human presence, uh, especially when a lot of inclement weather, uh, they would have more of the refuge to themselves, right. uh, and they also seem to be more active at night. So mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we've on the uh, on the aerial photographs, we've identified some very thick uh, wooded areas that they could uh, hide and rest in during the day here in the refuge, and then you know come out at night to hunt. There's a very high density population of white-tailed deer and all kinds of small mammals oh, yeah. things like that so uh, yeah that's just right across the river is very hard to actually access unless you right. have some kind of watercraft right and it's pretty much only accessible uh, by foot in the winter time uh, otherwise you can see the green ups already started and how thick it is um, it's going to get thicker yeah during spring summer and early fall uh, you know there, it's just ticks and mosquitoes and yeah. uh, snakes, things like <coughs> briars, so it's much easier to tra traverse during the winter time. So this river goes from here at Lake Overholzer and it winds back up. It goes north of El Reno to that area that you was talking about over by the Concho area, but it keeps going on up to Canton Lake, which is there's also a lot of reports up there that have trickled in over the years. And of course, that area, the, the, the Canton Wildlife Management Area, is massive. I mean, it's like it's divided into two sections, one on the upstream side of the lake and one on the downstream side. And there's just, there's so much habitat there too. And it makes you wonder, you know, are they moving up and down the river I mean, it's kind of a mystery. Is it the same clan or are there multiple clans? And it's just, it's kind of one of those mysteries that I don't know that anybody's going to be able to solve. But, right. you know, I personally would, it seems like to me, there's no need for them to move that far because there's, I mean, the white, we've got an army of white-tailed deer running around here. Mm -hmm. If they can survive year round in this location why couldn't bigfoot especially with the the plethora 
of human trash that's around here. Right. Yeah. And there's you know there's lots of dumpsters easily available here right. uh, at night uh, surrounding the refuge. Um, Big time. And there's there's reports of them um, getting, <coughs> getting into dumpsters. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think it's I think it's multiple small clans up and down the river, but small family groups and and some probably lone individuals. Yeah. So, Stinchcomb kind of intrudes in a way of saying it's kind of like a peninsula of of woods that penetrates into the Oklahoma City metro area. And do you think they come in here? And then they wait till night, and then they disperse uh, out into the urban areas. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've even received, you know, some reports to that effect. So, mm -hmm. um, just and 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 fairly recently, just uh, a few years ago, uh, there's a family that lives here along Stinchcombe Avenue that runs outside the refuge. Uh, there's a housing addition that runs right. along Stinchcombe Avenue. Uh, their backyard faces the refuge. Uh, they were out in their backyard on a summer evening, just enjoying the warm evening, night, and a, a white, they said it was a white Bigfoot, uh, white-haired Bigfoot that uh, ran down their fence and into the refuge. Really? So, uh, yeah. I wasn't even aware of that. This Jeez. was just, just a few years ago. Um, so, and, you know, they're still reporting activity today. Now. Um, that same family or? Um, well, yes, they said that there's, there is ongoing activity. Jeez. And that's just in a neighborhood on the edge of the refuge here. Yeah, that's what, not even three quarters of a mile from here, probably. Right. We have a, a report of a one crossing Wilshire Boulevard, Boulevard on the north edge of the refuge mm -hmm. um, not that long ago. Uh, so, wow. you know, just ongoing activity. Jeez. Uh, not just limited to years ago. You know, it makes a lot of sense that if smaller Bigfoot Sasquatch, if they were to come into this area at night, you know, as long as they're, you know, seven foot or under, they could probably, you know, stick to the shadows and walk around through some of these urban areas, going through dumpsters. And people might mistake them for just some homeless guy or, or, or something along that line. Yeah. You know, I mean, think of all the, the people who have actually seen one of these creatures and not recognized it for what it was just because it was smaller. Right, you right. Know? And I'm sure the, the big boys probably hang back here and wait. Right. So. Um, and I think you're going to talk to Chris Ramsey about uh, the report right. he received at the uh, donut shop on Highway 66 of a Classic dumpster example. raider. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And that involved a juvenile. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, hopefully we can get some more information from them because we're doing some follow-up work on that. Yeah. But, man. Yeah, this place, it just seems like to me it's, and I'm going to use the word staging area. It's like after the sun goes down, they move into this area, and then they wait. Right. And they wait for everything to get quiet, calm down. The, the the noise traffic from the road settles down, and and then they they disperse, I guess, into the suburban areas. Yeah. You know, and uh, and they probably got Big Papa somewhere hanging out. You know, in case anybody gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that wouldn't be a good thing if if you know something like that happened. Mm -hmm. Anyway. It's worth it's worth considering. I mean, I have no real evidence for that, but it would explain. It's the only plausible explanation that I've been able to come up with thus far for why they would spend so much time in an area that's literally surrounded by human activity. Right. Yeah. They're. I guess they're having to adapt to human population. Mm -hmm. But I believe historically they've been up and down the river here. Um, you know the. The Cheyenne tribal member that we knew, uh, <coughs> she, she passed away uh, just a few years ago, but um, she told us that there were actually uh, families in the Cheyenne tribe here at Concho that were assigned to feed, the, to feed these creatures 
so that they wouldn't bother, uh, you know, the, the tribe, but wouldn't bother people mm. and scare them. Um, That's and interesting. So, uh, I've heard that there's areas over there with sand plums that the tribe knows that they're not supposed to take sand plums from that area because it belongs to the Sasquatch sure. people. Sure. At least that's what I've been told. Yeah, so I mean, there's ongoing history from uh, a long time ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Makes you wonder how long it's going to last because it seems like every year, you know, the first time I ever came out here in 1996, this place was like almost out in the boonies. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, like, it was on the, the little edge, but now it's like, it's like everything is like surrounding it, you know. Right. And, a major know. turnpike goes through it now. Yeah, so, yeah, crazy. Um, but there still seems to be ongoing activity, and you wonder how, with them raiding dumpsters or trash cans and from residences, um, what the effect has been as far as human disease. I mean, are their numbers lower than they could have been because of that? Yeah. Or, I mean, there's just no way to know, but you just wonder what the effect of that we've had on them. The food we eat is not exactly right. good. Right, and the type of diet. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. It's hard to say. Maybe it's maybe it's uh, shortened their lifespan. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, it, when there's a free food source that's available and it gives, a, you know, the opportunity to back off of the deer population or the hog population and... And, and to just let them grow and increase in numbers, it just kind of makes sense. It's almost, it's almost like a food management technique. Mm -hmm. You know, if we've got this unexhaustible supply of free food, you know, they, it just makes sense that they would take advantage. Yeah. So, so Evans and I were just leaving our vehicles, and look what we found. Here we go. This thing is fairly large, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know if it's wide enough, but it almost looks like you can see toe structure in there. Fifteen and a half inches. All right, let's see how wide she is. just started down the trail. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> there, doesn't, there doesn't appear to be any others because because it gets dry. But, you know, we may we may find another one up there if he was continuing on that track. But this, I mean, it's a good three inches deep. Two, two and a half, three, yeah. The heels in right here, you can really see that. See that arch. Point. Oh, really? There's a bunch of charred stumps, and I swear you walk up on some of those stumps and, and you're taking a second look, you know, because it's like, what, what, what is that? Yeah. Black stumps will keep you guessing. Yeah. It is nice.
every once in a while, you know, the uh, discussion comes up about having an uh, archery controlled hunt out here. While we were there, Evans and I decided to go ahead and deploy a time-lapse camera over on the west side, watching over a marshy area. We had no idea at the time that we'd be able to get any footage at night, but turns out we did. What you're looking at is not actually a video. It's a series of pictures taken five seconds apart, and they're looped together in a video form. I had an abundance of nighttime video that just looked black, but once I started messing with the contrast and the sharpness, I ended up with this. Unfortunately, I didn't get any pictures of a Bigfoot, but I did get a lot of photos of deer, and I'm pleasantly surprised at how good this camera works at night, running just off of moonlight. The presence of so many deer in such a small area this close to suburbia just kind of backs up the fact that there's a lot of food sources for the Sasquatch here in the major metropolitan area. Jim Whitehead. Howdy. Thank you for taking time to uh, be a part of this project. No problem at all. So... How many years have you been uh, doing field investigation work? Oh, uh, about 18 now, I believe. 18, wow. And all of that's pretty much in Oklahoma? Yeah, for the most part, uh, central Oklahoma, though I have done quite a bit in the southeastern corner and a little bit up in the mm -hmm. northwestern Oklahoma as well. Yeah, eventually we all get out and about, don't we? Right. It's not something that you leave at home whenever you go places. No, it is not. So you have some, uh, some stories about stench comb that you've collected over the years. That I have. Yeah, and, uh, and, and the North Canadian River is also kind of tied in, of course, with it. And it goes, you know, it goes all the way up eventually to Canton. But uh, all of that is kind of tied together. And uh, you have some interesting stories. Uh, you was telling me earlier about this, this white lady Sasquatch that uh, I, I just it's got my my interest captivated you know and I've kind of in my mind I'm calling her the the white lady of Stinchcomb. <laughs> yeah know? I think locally she might be called the white witch but I'm not a hundred percent certain on that. Really? So she's got a big nose huh? <laughs> I don't know I've never seen her. Yeah well well when, when was the uh, the first uh, encounter that you've you've heard of? Well, I believe the first encounter was in 1996, no, excuse me, 97. 97. And what it is, is there was a guy that had some property that backed up kind of to the lake here. Right. To this, well, I say lake, swamp, but, mm -hmm. and he heard a growl. Mm -hmm. So he got kind of curious about it. He thought something was going on. And this guy was just here with his brother. And he had a big old rottweiler and he opened the back door because the growl was basically in his backyard near his shed mm -hmm. and he thought he might have had a coyote or something like that in there right so he opens the door the rottweiler runs out and the guy's essentially looking from his uh, kitchen window and about that time he sees an arm reach out and grab the dog by the neck and lift it up uh -oh. and the guy gets to looking and he sees this thing step out. And he said it was taller than him, at least seven foot, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And it was covered with long white hair. Right. And he said that, curiously enough, it had like an old burlap painter's tarp. It was wrapped around it, huh. which is kind of unusual. Yeah, we don't get a whole lot of reports but, on you know, stuff like that. I've, you know, I've heard stories of orangutans and chimps doing the same thing. True. So, but the uh, guy was looking and he could see enough of uh, the chest region to realize that this creature was female. Mm. And it had uh, a very weathered face, he said. 
Okay. And it basically, it snaps the dog's neck. Mm. And about right. that time, he, you know, he kind of beat on the glass of the kitchen window and it looks up and it roars and wakes his brother up <coughs> and takes off. And of course it took the dog with it. Now several days later, the partially eaten remains of the dog are actually brought back to this house. And that's some kind of message. Yeah, I, what I don't know. <laughs> but him and his brother actually found a uh, very large muddy handprint on the side of the house. Oh, wow. Well, like it had been slapped. Really? And it wasn't too far away from the dog. Hmm. And the same witness actually would have a later encounter here at Stinchcomb. He had uh, moved to Florida and came back right. to visit his brother. And his brother really hadn't had a whole lot happen since then. But they went well, hiking down one of these trails. And they said this was 2017, you know, 20 years af afterwards, right. that Dang. they observed the same creature hiding behind a tree and peeking out at them. And they said, you know, this time it looked a lot older, a lot more weathered and haggard. Wow. And that was not the only sighting of a white one that I've stumbled across in this area. Wow. That is interesting. So this guy had saw the same one, he believes. Yeah. 20 years apart, roughly in the same general area. Yeah. Wow. But his brother, who, now his brother was with him on the second one? Yes. Did, did he get to see it too? Uh, I believe so. Okay. That's interesting. Um, wow. Seems like to me this uh, this lady Squatch likes him. <laughs> so, or they just happen to be the humans that it might have accepted as part of its territory or something. Yeah. You know, th those humans just belong here. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting story about the returning of the dog. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure what to make of that. And on honestly, I'm not either. But the fact is, other people have seen. This particular creature, like what, like who? Well, in 2000, there was a uh, woman that uh, had some property not too far from here, within five miles, and there's a snowstorm, and hmm. she heard something outside of her house, and she kind of walked up to the window to look out, and she seen a face looking back in, hmm. and she described it as having gray skin and long white hair. And this creature looks in at her and basically smiles, and she reports seeing large, you know, oh, yeah. blocky teeth. <laughs> I bet she lost her cookies. Oh yeah. Huh. And uh, she she lives pretty close within five miles of Stitch. Yeah. I'm gonna guess it's probably not too terribly far from the river. Uh, no, actually, when I was looking it up on the map, I believe her place is probably within a quarter mile of the river. There you go. You wonder how much they go up and down the river. Oh, yeah. Was there any other reports? Uh, yes, there was. Um, this one was in 2008. A uh, witness had uh, been hearing some noises outside of the house, and something smacked the side of the house. Oh, yeah. Classic Bigfoot behavior. And basically, he went out to kind of check it out, and... As he was going out, he noticed something looking in the window, just like before. And again, it's a white-furred Bigfoot. Right. So. She's pretty nosy, isn't she? Yeah, well, probably prowling around looking for snacks. Probably. The uh, the Rottweiler didn't hold her for very long, <laughs> I guess. I don't... Not over 20 years. Golly. So that's that's four reports that you know of, of this white Bigfoot. Not all of them are confirmed to be the female. Right. But, but we're kind of gonna connect the dots. Um, there was another report that I'm not sure that it's okay to talk about, about an eyewitness here within the last couple of years that lives in their backyard, backs up to the Stinchcomb area and um, they had an encounter with a white Bigfoot, too, that uh, ran alongside their back fence and took off, headed back towards the woods at Stinchcomb. Yeah. And that was from a completely separate source than you. And does that sound like any of the same stories? Or 
um, completely separate to you. Again, it sounds like it's probably the same creature to me. I mean, mm -hmm. so 1997. When's the newest, the most recent report uh, you have? 2017 for the White Witch, I guess, or White okay. Lady, whatever we want to call her. <laughs> but you know, 2017. Excuse me. Right, and I I think that. Um, that report that we received, that I heard of, it did not come in through Red Dirt Cryptids. Uh, it, um, I think it's newer than that. Yeah. So. Yeah, so she's been around a while. Wow, yeah. It's interesting, you know, whenever you have one of these, you know, Sasquatches that have an identifying mark, you know, sometimes that gives you some insight into their age and their longevity. Well, I don't think it, it's her age that necessarily made her white. <coughs> it may yeah. just be natural coloring, but she's a good example of what I call a repeat offender. Or repeat you have offender. a you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I like that. I may, where, I may plagiarize that. <laughs> it's where you have, I, I kind of use this to describe several other encounters that I've been investigating, uh -huh. where you have a particular individual with a particular marking or color pattern or something that makes it really stand out uh -huh. that gets seen by multiple witnesses that don't right. know each other over right. a lengthy period of time That's... and that is honestly something i've never heard skeptics give a good explanation for because every witness should see the uniform sasquatch or be whatever their expectations are they right. shouldn't be seeing the same one no mm -mm. no that that just it, it greatly multiplies the credibility factor so that's good that's good stuff so other than the the white witch stories uh, do you have any uh, Bigfoot encounters from this area that are you know not of white Bigfoot um, yeah there's several of them uh, in the in the 1990s I don't have a specific year the witness couldn't remember Right. But I'm gonna I kind of assume it's the later nineties. Uh there was a witness about five miles from here. Uh, again, wooded area and not too far off the river. And they reported uh hearing something prowling around outside of their house, you know. Mm -hmm. And I believe their house got slapped mm -hmm. and the guy goes out to his front porch to kind of investigate and he goes out to his friend's front porch and he's not alone oh there's boy. something standing on the porch oh boy and he said it's about eight feet tall and dark colored and he looks at it and then it just kind of turns and makes a beeline out of there huh eight feet man kind of makes you wonder if they had dog food out on their back porch or something probably um, i've heard stories of that huh any others uh, yeah. Was that pretty close to, was that pretty close to the river? If I remember right, it was extremely close to the river, uh, within a half mile, I believe. Wow. Okay. But, uh, then this isn't really a sighting, but it was an event that happened in 1996 that scared a bunch of teenagers half to death. And this actually would have been down at the lake itself. Okay. Uh, there was a group of teenagers, and they parked out there just to hang out on the Saturday night and have fun uh, mm -hmm. down at uh, the parking area down here at uh, Overholster. Right. And they were doing, the city had been doing some construction out there on the parking area. Right. And they had a bunch of those concrete uh, bumpers. All those stacked tall up. ones? Yeah. The, you know, they're about four feet across, just enough to stop you from going across the Right the front end of a parking lot and they were installing those and again there's a stack of them sitting there well these teens pulled up and they're just hanging out in their van laughing joking around just killing time and you know they said something shook the van and they kind of they were kind of mm -hmm. spooked about that but then they just figured this is somebody screwing around they, yeah. uh, the van gets hammered something picked up one of those concrete bumpers and threw it like a javelin into the side of this van. Ooh. And... I wonder what one of those weighs. Uh, I actually looked them up, and I'm going to say the, the ones now weigh 275 pounds, and those are of less dense concrete. Right. So it's probably 300 pounds. Jeez. Yeah, I mean, it, it wrecked the side of that van. Man, I'd love to see some pictures of that. 
Yeah, they didn't have any pitchers, but uh, they probably got the hell out of there. They, yeah, they immediately got out of there, and to my, from what they said, they have not been back to this lake or Stinchcomb mm -hmm. again. You know, the sad part is because it was a bunch of teenagers, and you know, if they told anybody this story, it would. Oh, they were just smoking dope and whatever and blah, 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 or they were drinking. or they were Right. Drinking, you know, and so no matter what, these kids were, because of their age, you know, they're instantly uncredible as witnesses, you know. But, uh, you know, you, you'd think you'd, if you were going to make up a story, you'd make up a better story. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the witnesses never flat out said it was a Bigfoot, but they couldn't think of what, what could be strong enough to chunk one of those bumpers at them. Right, exactly. I don't know, I, I wouldn't want to meet it in the dark. No. So, well, maybe I would, but <laughs> it's like peace. What else you got for me? Okay. Uh, 2009, there were, again, this is back out to the west of here, about five miles. Uh -huh. There were some uh, teenagers that were hiking, and they went up this dirt road that goes up to the river, and there's an old homestead that's long since been abandoned and right. fallen apart, but they wanted to go see that homestead, and they, they're walking up this dirt road, and it goes to their wooded section, not unlike the area around here. Mm -hmm. And this is the middle of the day, mind you. Really? Oh. Yeah. And they're going up this road, and much to their surprise, uh, you know, I can't remember, it was maybe 15 yards into the woods, they see shapes m moving around. Plural? And, huh? More than one? Yeah, there was at least three. Oh, wow. Ooh. Mm. And they said they were dark, maybe black, blackish brown, uh -huh. very tall. And the nearest one to them kind of stood up, and they, based on the body language, they said it kind of puffed its chest out a little. Right. Like it was, you know, kind of getting aggressive with them. Then it drops to all fours and charges them. Good gravy. And the kids took off. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> you know. And, and what year was that? Uh, 2009. Yeah, there's five miles up there. That... That's up into the Yukon area. You yeah, know, it's closer to Yukon. Pushing the Express Ranch area, yeah. That's interesting. You know, when I was living in Yukon when I was younger, um, I was told that the very far, what would be the northwest corner of Yukon, there's kind of an area there that's not as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A little more economically challenged there in that area and I was told years and years ago that there was a a monster that people were seeing getting in their trash cans in that area but you know that was before I was documenting anything and I, I really didn't have a clue what I was doing I mean I probably heard this story in like 98 or something like that and uh, it was one of those stories you just kind of remember, but you, I can't even remember who told me the story. But it, it's really not that far from the river going south back towards Yukon. Well, you know, funny you should say that because I've got a uh, report from 1997. A woman said she saw something. She said it looked like the wolf man and I'm not saying werewolf but she, she was saying it looked like the old 1950s wolf man okay. makeup but she said it was about 8 foot tall and gray where and was that at? somewhere over on the other side of Yukon oh gosh and she basically seen this thing running through a field towards a tree line wow well to the best of my knowledge I don't think there's been a whole lot of dog man encounters recorded around Stinchcomb I mean bare minimum it's it's if there are it's it's a lot less than what we have with the sasquatch well this firstly i'm of the opinion she saw a sasquatch and she's describing it looking like the old lunch any wolf man well you may be right i mean i could see where you know a lot of our sasquatch around here are kind of tall and lanky and you know she might have uh might have put two and two together yeah 
I mean, I, I, I believe that a lot of distant dogmen reports get misinterpreted as, you know, Bigfoot and vice versa. I think it's hard to, you know, when you're talking something that's, you know, out past 50 yards. Yeah, right. You're just seeing a big black shape. Right. So um, I'm sure there's going to be some misinterpretation on both ends. So. Oh, yeah. Anything else you got? Yeah, there's at least one more in my files. Uh, this was uh, 2012. Uh-huh. Uh, we were still recovering from that big drought. Okay. And, you know, a lot of the animals during droughts will actually move closer to town because there's food and water near human settlements. Right. And this actually occurred on that side of Stinchcomb in a housing addition that kind of comes up, you know, within a block or two of Stinchcomb. Right. And there was a uh, family there, and they started hearing stuff. And mm-hmm. their house is kind of at the end of the end of the road, and you know, they've got woods behind it. And right. they were of the impression, you know, they got coyotes or something out there. Right. Something was getting into the trash. They were hearing noises. Raccoons. It's always raccoons. Yeah. Well, the, it ain't. the wife of the house got up in the middle of the night after hearing noise. And she went to go check it out. I think she was actually going out to smoke is what she was. Right. But she wasn't going to tell that in the, to her husband. <laughs> yeah. But, uh. Basically, they see something getting into their trash, or she sees something getting into her trash. And she says, whatever it is, it was extremely tall, very lanky looking. Uh But it was covered in gray hair. Right. And strangely enough, she just, it it looked at her, and she said the eyes reflected back yellow in the porch light. And she described the face, the facial features as almost feline. She said it kind of, the the width of the nose kind of reminded her of like a lion's nose. Hmm. Interesting. But the creature howls at her. Uh-huh. Then it starts off of walking across the yard, then drops to all fours and just takes off in a dead run. Wow. And what's really kind of funny is I've got another report that is just a little bit further in town, but it took place just a few weeks after this. Okay. And there was a uh, there was a girl that was going to work. She'd been going to college and, and just working this little part-time job trying to pay her way through school. Right. And as she's going uh, to work, in this wooded section on a creek that if you follow the creek it hooks up to this place right uh she says there's something had been hit on the side of the road and she says she didn't know what it was because she said it was huge uh-huh. and whatever it was was recent because she said there was still some there, there was fresh blood and uh oh wow uh the <laughs> antifreeze from the radiator of the vehicle that smacked it uh-huh. And she said she thought it was still breathing. Mm. So whatever this is, it had literally just been smacked. Wow. But she said it was covered in grayish black hair. And she said on the ground, laying on its side, because she was looking at it from the back, it had the profile similar to a person. But she said it was about, you know, it would have been at least three foot across the shoulders. And it's 2012. Yeah. Jeez. And she said again. She said it was still breathing. She pulled up to a gas station because she turned around and wanted to see what it was. And she also said she seen the feet, and the feet looked kind of like human feet. Oh my gosh. And she turned around. I'd love to interview that lady. And uh, she said it was gone. She didn't know if. It had gotten up and managed to get to the creek and take off. So this had just happened. Yeah, this was because uh, this this was at night. No, this was early morning. So it had just happened that that yeah probably at dusk. Right. She said she didn't know if it took off or if there was another one on the side of the road that grabbed it and drug it off or. 
Wouldn't be surprised. I've heard stories of such. Right. Hmm. But Jeez. it was it just the fact that it was so close in proximity and the time to that other one where the uh, yeah. one was raiding the trash, it actually makes me yeah. question whether or not it was the same creature. Was she, uh, she was alone? Yeah, she was, again, she was just driving to work. Yeah, I hate that stuff. You know, when you, when you have an encounter and you're all alone, there's nobody else there to back up your story. And uh, then it leaves you, you know, wondering, am I losing my mind, you know? And so she saw it. Obviously, whoever hit it with their vehicle saw it. And I'm sure there were several other people that saw it. Uh, she actually initially thought it was a bear until she seen the, the outline and the right. shape of the feet. Man, but I'm, I'm guessing the other people that seen it probably thought it was a big dog or something. Right. A really, really big dog. Man, I would like to, uh, I would like to talk to anybody that saw that, but that's been a long time ago, you know? Yeah. So, we may have discovered a trackway coming from over here where Jim's at, back up through here, leading up to this print, which is pretty substantial. That's that's pretty large. And it looks like it takes off, and it may end up going out that way. It's kind of hard to say. I did not bring my muck boots today. Let me do a scan of verse and let me get out of my light here. Is it better? No. The, the flat of the foot's better, but the toe detail's lost. Yeah. So Chris, you you have a interesting story that came your way uh, a couple years ago that uh, was that took place right on the outskirts of Stinchcomb. You want to uh, tell us a little bit about how you came to hear that story and what happened? Yes. So this was about 2017, right after the incident happened, and um, my friend Ben Prentice had told me the story through someone that he knew mm -hmm. and I don't know who that person is but he knows so it was that and I guess the Beth Bethany Police Department was involved but right. good luck trying to find that information basically you'd almost have to have somebody on the inside yeah yeah so um, like I said this was 2017 I don't remember what months it was but he had told me Ben Prentice had told me that he had heard it from a source um, and he was friends with certain people that had the inside of this. Right. And so he People we just, don't necessarily need to put that information out. Correct. There. Correct. So mm -hmm. the story goes over at Stinchcomb, right at Council in 66. Uh, there's a big bridge there, the old bridge. There is a donut shop over there just west of Council and to the south. Right. Okay, this was sometime in 2017. The don donut shop had an employee. We don't know who it was. We don't know if they're still there or if they're gone. This was in 2017. So supposedly he gets to work. He's taking the trash out between 2 and 3 a.m. and there's a dumpster behind. He comes out there, he throws the bag of trash into the dumpster and he's startled and something comes out of the dumpster and it was a baby Sasquatch, baby juvenile Sasquatch. Is that correct? That, that, yeah. That's around the description that I received. Right. And I'm hearing the story and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, there's no way. There's no way. The donut shop, I mean, the donut shop employee, he just sitting there watching this. There's a mama Bigfoot because 
they said it had breast. And the big, the mama Bigfoot picked up the baby out of the trash dumpster, picked it up, put it on the shoulder or the front area right here. And the thing took off uh, going north across Highway 66, Highway 66, across the road, going straight into Stinchcomb. There's a wooded area that's right across the highway there. Yes, correct. Wow. And so the mama Bigfoot wasn't in there initially, but as soon as the baby was discovered, she, she appeared in short order. Yeah, she was, she was hidden and she popped out from behind the dumpster and really startled the, the employee. And um, mm. Jeez, I it went imagine. that direction and I could only imagine what that employee has to say or what, what they could uh, emphasize on, on this subject right now. Time so. to make the brownies. Yeah. Not donuts. Exactly. <laughs> Here I'm going to take you around the back side of the donut shop right off of Highway 66. Give you a look at the dumpster where the employee had the encounter. I'm going to speculate that the mother Bigfoot was on the back side of this Connex. As you can see, it's pretty dark back here at night. So, Ryan, you recently um, got a report that came in through the Nobro uh, group that uh, was fairly recent about a man and his daughter that had some unusual encounters down there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I'd be happy to tell you about that. So. We were on a fall camp out at Boggy Depot. You were you were there as well. And I set up a phone interview with this eyewitness, and we talked to him over the phone and did a phone interview. And so he and his daughter, it started out, they saw the episode, season three, episode three of Finding Bigfoot, where they were actually in Stinchcomb. And I'm going to call him Mr. H. Mr. H said, to his daughter you know we live so close to there and she was like really into it and she wanted to go see stenchcomb so this was around 2012 2013 and so they started hiking at stenchcomb and he says that the very first time they were there they did find a trap and so that kind of got their curiosity and everything and uh, they also heard some tree knocks and so that was just like really neat and so they kind of started started a tradition of hiking there very often and they weren't thinking bigfoot at this point but they were having fun hiking around 2020 uh, mr h was hiking with his girlfriend and they started hearing these tornado sirens as he describes it uh he actually thought it was a tornado siren at first and he's like you hear that to his girlfriend she's like yeah they started thinking it was an alarm like from a house nearby because there are houses you can see houses if you're hiking the perimeter road and so he was thinking it was an alarm and so anyway they heard four or five of these tornado sirens and uh that really baffled him but at this point he still wasn't really thinking bigfoot activity yet so fast forward to july 2021 he's walking uh in stenchcomb again with his daughter and his girlfriend and so they're hiking and uh they're they're hiking towards the back of the park and they hear like these thuds like thud 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 right off of the trail and the daughter says what's that and he's like what do you mean and the daughter says that tree sounds like it's breathing and so mr h went on to describe that the breathing sounded like this weird asthmatic type breathing like someone who was just running and so that stuff that got him to start thinking more about Bigfoot stories that he's heard around Stinchcomb and just um, just naturally and anywhere. And then if you do, uh, if you fast forward to December 2021, uh, it's around Christmas time, and Mr. H I guess apparently gets a flashlight and he wants to test out his flashlight. And so he thinks, oh, what better place to test it out than Stinchcomb? And so it's nighttime. They go to Stinchcomb. He uh, describes that the new flashlight lights up the entire road, that perimeter road, and then 20 feet off of the road on right and left. So it must have been a very bright flashlight. Right. And so he's testing that out. And then at one point, 
he gets his flashlight out and he's he's scanning a tree line and as he he passes a point and he sees something and so he gets he gets the flashlight over here and, they, and he brings it back and uh he naturally saw something and he asked his girlfriend did you see that and she says yeah the face and he, and he was like yeah and so that really baffled him uh at this point and so now he's starting to think okay I'm going home and I'm going to start researching the whole Bigfoot phenomenon at this point because we saw this face at night. Uh, could have been a person, but he is like really intrigued. So from there, they start hiking two or three times a week and um, they're hearing growls, they're hearing monkey noises, he says at one point. And when he hears, when he hears these sounds, uh, he's, he's uh, thinking, oh man, this is man there's something to this and so then he goes home and he's at some point he's watching tv and he hears the ohio howl the famous ohio howl and so he runs in the next room to his girlfriend or daughter i don't remember which one and he says hey listen to this doesn't this sound it must have been the girlfriend does this sound like the tornado sirens that we heard like back in 2020 and she says oh yeah it does so that tornado siren sound was like very very close to the ohio howl to him so now we're at his visual encounter he does have a visual encounter this is around june 30th of 2022 so basically i'll try to keep it short he and his daughter um, are hiking to the back of the park they get to what i'm going to call the communication building it's just a tiny little building structure and the the perimeter road takes a hard left right there and so they go around that hard left and um, maybe a couple hundred more yards and they get to a spot and to his left, he sees something and he looks and he points it out to his daughter who's with him. And he says, do you see that? She's like, what? He's like, it's a shadow back there. And so she gets flipped out and she sees the shadow and he makes the statement of, uh, judging by her reaction to the shadow he knew what he was looking at was actually there and it was actually real because he was judging off of her reaction to it and so she kind of flips out gets kind of spooked and she she runs she walks off she goes she just leaves keeps going like she doesn't want to stick around and see the shadow and so he actually stays and he's like still observing the shadow creature he says it's like around 25 feet off of the trail Mm-hmm. He notices that it's like around his height, maybe a little taller. That would put it around six foot, six foot one. He says it was like four feet wide. Oh. And then he's he's still looking at it. And what he, what he notices is it has its back to him. He's looking at the back of it. And he said, he says he can see it breathing. And it's like, when I say breathing, it's physically like breathing up and down like this motion. Okay. He can't see its legs. He says there's too much brush in the way, but he did make the comment that it had an athletic butt. And so he was very impressed uh, with this creature. And uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of the basic visual encounter. Wow. Uh, And how long has it been since you've uh, talked to him? Is he, is he still going out there? You think? Oh yeah, definitely. So, uh, after after I talked to him on the phone and got got this whole interview, uh, we actually went to Stinchcomb again, and I actually met him face to face, and we he kind of walked us through some of those things, and he showed me the exact location where the sighting happened, and they had he had another encounter where like all these like an eight foot wide area was like just trees just shaking violently. He showed us that area, and just uh, showed us several spots, um, and yeah he. And he claims, he says that almost every time that he goes, he gets some kind of activity, whether it be a sound, a wood knock, whatever, or just a creepy feeling like he's being watched. Wow. Wow. And I remember him saying he only lives like around 10 minutes from the park, and he has a dog, so he's like always going there to dog walk or just wow. hike with his daughter or girlfriend. Huh. I wonder if the uh, the the happenings are, are more frequent when he has the dog that'd be interesting to ask but no that's that's a great story and uh that's pretty cool that you got to actually go out there 
and meet with him and, and actually see the location. We don't get as in, as investigators, we don't get to do that near near often enough, you know. So it definitely helps that it was a park, like a park, because yeah, what you're saying is a lot of times this hap- sightings happen on people's private land, and that's the reason they don't want to share the location because they don't want people poking around their land. So since right. this was like a public park. Yeah, he had no problem sharing the, the location with us. Yeah. Yeah, and people people already knew about the, the situation out there anyway. So, wow, that's really cool. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Hey, no problem. <sighs> so, you've actually found evidence out here at Stinchcomb yourself, right? Correct. Yeah, Dustin Clark and I were out here, I believe, in 2017. Uh, we were on the east side of the wildlife refuge and it was it was cold i know it was winter time or late fall and we walked up on a couple of sets of tracks they weren't like super large like a lot of bigfoot tracks they weren't you know 20 inches or 16 like other tracks that we have found but they were on a uh, a utility road that was going through there they were walking side by side and it was just odd that they would be you know barefoot in that type of weather and they both went side by side for quite a while, maybe there might have been 50, 60 of them, maybe 70. Oh and my. then they both veered off in opposite directions and went into the timber. And so we just found that very odd. And we took uh, a few photos. Uh, I didn't have a tape measure or anything like that. We were kind of just really weren't very optimistic about the area. And all I had was that dollar bill for reference. And you see it in the photo that I, that I right. sent you. So. Wow, that must have been crazy. It was odd for sure. So yeah, well, I think that there's a lot of people come out here just to you know get away, you know, because you don't really live that far away from here. No, this is a close trip for me. I'm, I right. can be here in about 30 minutes. So, uh-huh. um, and oh. then of course we did find the structure on the west side, um, and like I was telling you earlier, it was uh, 20. I believe it was 27 foot in total length. It was 12 foot wide at the base and about eight and a half, nine foot in the center. And it was just kind of like this, uh-huh. made a little peak like that, had an opening on both ends. Right. And on one end, there was a, a well-used game trail going through there. Oh, wow. Uh, so we found that odd, no saw marks, nothing like that that we could find. Now this is not the one that's over there that everybody that Everybody knows. has labeled, no sir, no, yeah. not that one. The, so, what yeah, is that, the, Bigfoot's home? Or Bigfoot, whatever. yeah, Bigfoot's hut or something yeah. that they labeled. There used label to be a tarp in there. And yeah, no, not yeah. that one. This one's this one's over here where the, uh, it's not as accessible, I'll, I'll say that. So. Okay, interesting. And uh, that was what, five years ago? Yeah, it was probably around that same time, 2017, 18, right around there. So. Wow. Well, you know, when you spend time out here, you're eventually going to stumble off onto stuff. And and the funny thing is about this place, a lot of people come here, but very few people go off trail. Yeah. Yeah, a lot so. of people don't like going off trail. I mean, they're not made for it. <laughs> they're not dressed for it. They're right. not prepared for it. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people are afraid to venture off into unknown areas, you know, especially people that live in the city. You know, they didn't grow up in the woods like a lot of people, so. Maybe they should be. They might be if they knew what was walking around here. So, <laughs> well, thanks for sharing your you story. You bet. You bet. All the way up here and find these tracks. Looks like they're like clawed toes. That's where the arch should be, and then the heel. I wear a size 12 boot. And they're all up and down this trail. Found one worth really, really good. They're older. Some have toes. Their big toe is just freakishly longer than the other toes, like an inch longer. Okay. Now that 
There's the heel. There's the toes. Is that, that can't be a shoe. That's got to be bare foot. But why is there so much space here? So, Mr. Whitehead, why is it that you think that Stenchcomb has such a high number of reports coming out of here? Well, I think it's like a lot of areas where you have wildlife uh, congregating on the edge of an urban center. Uh, it's good habitat. You've got an excellent travel way wildlife corridor in the form of the river flowing through here. Mm -hmm. On top of that, us being so close to town and with the additional resources that are already here as far as uh, you know, edible plants and game, you've also got people coming out here and eating their lunch, throwing the trash away, <laughs> and you know, town's literally right over there so they could sneak in at night and raid trash cans. Right. Do you think that's a pretty common thing? More common than people think. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just an easy place for them to get in here. And I'm not saying they'd be here 24 seven year round, but they could come in here and hole up for a few days and uh -huh. kind of refill their batteries for a little bit before they move off to wherever they came from. Right. So bare minimum, it's a, it's a layover point or right. a staging area, right? But it is possible. Do you think it's possible that they might live in this general area year round? I would argue it's probably too small for them to be here permanently. Makes you wonder. But I, if it's like a lot of the areas, they're probably here, you know, maybe every couple of weeks. Right. You know, it is small, but it's, it's also the way the river moves through here. I mean, you couldn't catch one here. No. I mean, all it's got to do is cross the river and it lost you. Well, to be honest, you look out there at all these uh, reeds, there could be one out there just kind of squatting down, hunkered down, watching us, and we wouldn't see it. No. Maybe that's where it sleeps during the day. <laughs> I don't know. Well, thank you for your time. Mm-hmm. So, Ryan, you've been investigating Stenchcomb now for several years at least. What is it about that particular location that makes you you know, think that what's the reason behind all these Bigfoot reports coming out of such a small area? Yeah, so Stinchcomb is roughly a thousand acres and it's right there, I guess, on the northwest boundary of Oklahoma City, Yukon. And so when you venture further out from there, you're getting into northwest Oklahoma and the North Canadian River runs through northwest Oklahoma all the way up to the Woodward area and and uh, anyway, so I think that what's happening is possibly the Bigfoot are traveling along those river corridors and staying within the trees of, along the river. And once they make it to the Oklahoma City area, I mean, they can't go into the city. So that's kind of a dead end spot. And they have the water resource of Lake Overholzer. Mm -hmm. They have the North Canadian River. And then they have that 1,000 acres just to hang out is what I think is happening. And, and I always thought that it was like just kind of a, I call it a truck stop or a, a dead end for them. Yeah. And so they would just hang out there temporarily and then they might go back up north or somehow venture around Oklahoma City and hook back up with the river somewhere. And interestingly enough, um, here lately, one of our investigators for NOBRO, the Native Oklahoma Bigfoot Research Organization, Scott Starr, he's actually been getting reports uh, south of Overholzer, and he's actually gone out there and investigated, and he's thinking that they're making their way around that area south of the lake and then venturing on, continuing on, continuing on south or southeast. So that makes sense. I just think it's a, I just think it's an interesting spot, so close to Oklahoma City. Um, just naturally you have to stop there and, and not venture into the city because you know they're going to be seen uh so they have to stop there and hang out in that in the, the thousand acres of wooded area do you think that they wait until night time and then they come in and, and maybe raid dumpsters or something i've heard stories of that 
Yeah, so that's probably happening. Yes, uh, we do have the stories of that happening, and there's a donut shop nearby. Uh, there's a story all along with that. I don't know all the details of that story, but so yeah, I do think that's that's happening. Um, when I've gone out, we've seen shelters and interesting structures, uh, maybe like a possible blind where they're hanging out in and waiting for a, a deer or something to come along the trail. So. Uh, there's probably some daytime activity as well, but yes, I think they definitely come out at night. Uh, I've heard, personally heard a wood knock at night, and uh, a, an eyewitness that I've talked to, he says that, according to him, they're coming out at dusk, and he's had several encounters. Wow. Wow. Well, <clears throat> that definitely kind of sheds a little light on everything, and, and I appreciate your input. Because uh, you know, the more heads we put together on this topic, the you know maybe maybe we'll come closer to getting some answers. Brian, why is it that you think that uh, stench comb, for being as small as it is and as close proximity to the Oklahoma City metro area, why do you think there's so many Bigfoot reports that come out of this tiny little area? Well, I think what people fail to remember and realize is this isn't how it always was, right? Oklahoma City has kind of developed around this area, around the river, and of course they built the lake, it's man-made, but we, I think we've kind of had so much growth in the area that it's funneled these things into this area. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the biggest part, and, and we, you know, we tend to forget that this area didn't look nothing like this 100 years ago, but this has always been home to them, and we've moved in on their area. And so as we develop and continue to develop, we're just, kind of pushing these things into tighter areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd probably already have taken this area over if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, this area floods and nobody wants flood land. Yeah, so. and if you think about the location of it, with it being here on the river, I mean, we could follow this all the way up to, a, you know, a real popular sighting uh, towards the casino, you know, yeah. and we know that they are always, everything needs water to survive, so Who's to say they're not continually traveling this area up and down the river? So, makes exactly. for a perfect place. A lot of there's a lot of wildlife here. There's wild hogs here. There's deer here. Uh, obviously, fish, turtles, things like that. So, right now, do you think that uh, they come into the suburban areas at night at all? I would I would think so, just because it's easy meals. Uh, I mean, if you can go flip a lid on a trash can and find some some leftover food, things like that, uh, grease traps that are at restaurants. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty minimal energy, you know, spent to, to gain those those calories that they need to, to right. survive. So yeah, I, I, I would probably do that. Even if I was a homeless man living here, I'd probably raid trash cans, so. Exactly, well, they do all the time. Exactly, yeah. Wow. So, Evans, you, have been around and you've been following this this stench comb thing for several years now what is it that you think makes stench comb special why do you think they're here do you have any i mean nobody knows for sure but do you have uh, any theories well uh you know i've been looking into it since 2014 when uh when uh, got involved with the north canadian river project um and uh, it just seems like the the North Canadian River corridor, um, all the way over through El Reno up to Calumet, probably on further northwest. Um, there's so many stories, so many encounters that have happened along the river, um, right. and continue to happen, continue to get reports. I I think historically, it was one of the areas that they have have always been in. And right. always used and moved up and down the river, uh, but it's the it's the primary habitat in this area. Um, mm -hmm. Down along the riparian areas, the rivers and streams is where you find mostly uh, wooded bottomlands, forest. Um, so there's cover, there's food, there's abundant wildlife. Just looking at all the deer tracks coming in and all the uh, small game that we small animals that we've seen out here. Right. Uh, there's there's plenty of food supply, of course, water uh, water supply from the river, uh, fish, 
uh, uh, freshwater clams, mussels. There's all so, kinds of natural food sources out here for sure. Right. So I believe that uh, it's just that it's the, the quality of the habitat in this area that and um, you know we're still trying to figure out how they use how and when what parts of the year are they more active in this area. Um, but I really believe they uh, there's some small clans in this area and they move up and down the river um, to not exhaust the uh, resources that they have here. Right. Okay, it's time to retrieve the audio recorder that I left out. Let's see here. Let's see if it's still running. Welcome to your own opinion, of course, but it sounds like to me that something is coming towards the audio recorder bipedally, and it's not on the trail. Uh, Eric and I were walking up and down the trail, and the trail was free of leaf litter, and whatever this was, it was like it was coming up the fence line or coming up through the woods. I don't know why a human would do that. You draw your own conclusions. Your guess is as good as mine. But I can tell you this. When we came in on Friday, and this recording is from a Friday night, the trash dumpsters up at the stadium were full. That's when I deployed the audio recorder. When we came back on Sunday to pick them up, the trash dumpsters were empty. We decided that since other people had had encounters after dark while walking the trail, we thought it might be a good way to start, so we started walking. It's about 9.45 at night, and we're on the trail on the north side of the river.
Watch out, it's muddy. Oh yeah. You see it? Yeah, I'll show you a light on it. That's a pretty big snake. Is it underwater? Not at first. Wow. Shine your light on the bank. Are you gonna hit it with something? Hit the opposite bank. Cool. That was a pretty big snake. I think so, yeah. Maybe not at this specific point, but they do further down. Did you hear that? No. Come up here. The direction that I'm pointing my phone, Yeah. there was a noise. Did it shine my light? I don't care. Like how far out? Uh, it was a little further this way. Yeah, but it was further out. It's almost like it was coming from the road. After it rains. It gets really quiet. Even humans can move through the woods a lot quieter. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't have any encounters on the trail that night, but this investigation is far from over. This place will be the subject of investigations for many years to come. If you or someone you know has had an encounter at Stinchcomb, please reach out to us. We would love to document it and hear your story. And as always, We'd appreciate it if you like and subscribe and share our material and get the word out about Red Dirt Cryptid Investigations.